opening in-person vineyard today. Whoop, whoop. It's good to see everybody. <laughs> All right. Um, I just want to start us off in prayer today. Um, just bow our heads real quick and just take a quick moment. God, we just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here together with our family and friends. And I pray that you would just speak to each of us in a way that we understand this week. And I pray that you would give us the ears to listen and um, see the signs of your presence, God. And Holy Spirit, come. We stand our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship them now. How great, how awesome is he. Yeah. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he. Together we sing Everyone sing Holy is the Lord God Almighty The earth is filled with His glory Holy is the Lord God
Can 
Announcements, announcements. No, I'm not Karen. <laughs> My name's Brenda, and welcome. Hey, can we just give a one more just praise clap for that worship? That was awesome, wasn't it? Woo! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, hold on. Coordination here. So, first we're going to shout out to all the May birthdays. So, if you have a May birthday, can you raise your hand? Oh, look at that. Woo, we got two, three raise. Yep. All right, and I'm trying to, hold on. My announcements are on here. Um, the ushers, can you take the uh, offering, please? Thank you. And starting this Wednesday, May 5th, um, we're going to do um, s Disciple Series with Caesar. So, you know, our Potluck Wednesdays on, um, on Zoom. And that is, um, it's a five-week series. And don't miss his understanding, to understand what a true disciple truly is. To, to, to go and make disciples as Jesus commanded. So all of you are invited and encouraged to come and attend at 7 p.m. to 8, 15 p.m. on Zoom. And we always send you a link ahead of time so you remember. And you can come jump on, on, on in with us. And Sunday, May 9th, does anybody know what Sunday, May 9th is? Mother's Day, so remember to appreciate your mother, okay, on Mother's Day. And Sunday, May 16th, is from 12 to 2 at the office, will be with me, with Miss Brenda, a parents and kids fun time. So please sign up um, at info at bridgewater.church, okay? And um, let's see, okay, one more thing. Sunday, May 26th, um, no, May 22nd, sorry, Saturday. Let me do that again. Do over. Saturday, May 22nd, movie night. Invite your friends. Um, the link will be on, uh, be up this week on Evenbrite because you need to register. Okay? So that's the announcements. And now, yay, announcements, announcements. Now we're going to do communion. Is that correct? Okay. Come on up, Deb. Nope. Oh, I have to pass them out. Okay. We're going to pass out communion. Good morning, folks. And um, let's see. We can get the elements passed out. So, communion. What is this? This is remembering Christ's sacrifice. He knew he would be betrayed, and he knew he would suffer, but he also knew why. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, it says, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he even gave us a way that we can together remember and even participate in his own sacrifice. In Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20, and when the hour for the Passover meal came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So today as we participate, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, let us remember the ultimate sacrifice Christ made, as well as why he made it. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Good morning. So, um, 
I just want to have something here I want to read, if I can find it here. Um, <clears throat> it says, Jesus told us why we celebrate communion when he in instated it. He said, do this in remembrance of me. When we take communion, we are remembering Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. The bread, the wine are tangible, visible reminders of Christ's love. Rather than simply saying, remember, Jesus gave us a reminder. Just as we depend on food and drink to live physically, we can only live spiritually through Christ. Communion is a time of just that, communing. It is a chance to bring ourselves before the Lord and partake in the life he has given, given us through his death and resurrection. So, and it says, while we were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, and when he, he was, has given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We just want to thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice to us and to save us, Lord God. And, um, we just, um, we just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again, folks. Good morning. Ah. Carly and the team, thank you so much. That was an, that was an amazing worship service. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks, everybody, for who's come up to support to make sure that this goes. I do hope, Paul and Karen, as you're seeing this, that you're having an absolutely amazing time. Um, so, well, if... For anybody who doesn't already know, my name's Henry. I am the worship leader here. And um, when Paul asked me to speak, he asked me to speak on what worship, what the concept of worship. So we look at worship, it's kind of like part and parcel with the Christian life. And we can look at a Webster's definition um, of worship being to honor or show reverence for God, to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. And this is kind of an important little thing to remember as we're going through this, because this is really what I'm going to be touching on, is honoring God, showing reverence for God, regarding him with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. So yeah. Now, in the modern worship service, and we're talking here like your normal modern Sunday morning service, we've kind of got a formula that we go through. Um, we've got the welcome, we've got the musical worship, um, there will be some announcements, we'll go through and there will be a sermon, and at the end of the sermon, depending on, upon the church, there might be ministry time, there might be an altar call, you know, that kind of thing. So, in this service, no matter who you are, no matter where you're sitting, no matter what you're doing, every single one of us has a part we play, and every single one of us has a side of the stage upon which we stand. So, what are these sides of the stage? What exactly does this, make, does this mean? Well. Roughly speaking, there are three that I come up with right off the rip, and that is backstage, on stage, and facing the stage. So let's look at these real quick. What's backstage? Okay, 
Anybody who's done sediment teardown, anybody who's working as a sound engineer, anybody who's working as a projectionist, you know, the, the supporting roles that make the service happen, the people who come back and aren't necessarily noticed, not because they're unimportant, but because if the, ba if the people backstage aren't, doing it, or aren't, aren't being noticed, the people backstage are doing it right. You know, if the people backstage are noticed, something went wrong. But that's okay. Things go wrong. And without those folks who are backstage, without those folks who are, you know, setting up, who are tearing down, without those folks who are um, doing, all the, doing all the technical stuff going on, without those folks, the service just, it, let me put it to you this way, it just gets difficult. <laughs> so, yeah, backstage. Pretty, uh, pretty obvious what that is. Again, uh, again, obvious what that is, is on stage, okay? This is, this is by far the most obvious group when you think about, when you think about a worship service. And when you're looking, um, and some may, some may actually think that the folks on stage are the most prestigious. Now, I would argue that anybody who views being on stage as being, pre as being prestigious within the context of the church probably doesn't understand how being on stage and worshiping from the stage works and how it should work. That's not to say that there isn't some measure of, you know, some measure of notice. That's not to say there isn't some measure of appreciation. And that isn't to say that there will be folks who say, I want to be on stage. That's fine. That's all fine. Now, who are the folks who you see on stage? Well, obviously, the worship team, the worship leader. Um, you've got your lead pastor, and if it's not the lead pastor speaking, whoever's coming up and speaking. So, like, Brenda was on stage. Debbie was on stage. The worship team, on stage. Okay? Again, fairly obvious. Now, what about facing the stage? In my opinion... Facing the stage is the most impactful of these three sides. Those who are facing the stage are perfectly capable of worshiping without anyone on stage and without anyone backstage. You don't need a worship team to worship. You don't need a church building to worship. You know, just get together, and all of a sudden, everybody just starts singing. Everybody just starts praising. I've seen it happen. You know? Now, if you're facing the stage, you're also encouraging those who are backstage and those who are on stage. And I can't begin to tell you just how impactful that is, to have those who are facing the stage be engaged in worship, to have those who are facing the stage be engaged in what's going on in the service, to really just feel that. And that's not just when I'm on stage. It's when I'm backstage, too, I felt that. There's a lot of props to go out to those who are facing the stage. Those who are facing the stage are demonstrating the praising of God's name. This is Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Whenever the living creatures gave glory or give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will, they were created and have their being. Okay. So pretty simple, right? Three sides of the stage. Backstage, on stage, facing the stage. Here's the trick, though. By the definition I'm using, the Merriam-Webster definition, that's only happening during 
the worship service. All this, the entire worship service, is typically reserved for about an hour or so on a Sunday morning. So, what about the rest of the week? What does that look like? So it's a question that I asked myself as I worked over presenting the sides of the stage. And I came to recognize that I was missing a side. There's a fourth side of the stage. And that's away from the stage. Whether you're on stage, whether you're backstage, whether you're facing the stage, most of the week we spend away from the stage. We're away from the stage when we're at home cleaning house. We're away from the stage when we're out at the grocery store. We're away from the stage when we're at work chatting with our coworkers. When we're away from the stage when we're at a club meeting or other hobby social gathering. When we're out on the boat fishing or out on the bike riding or out in the woods hiking. We're away from the stage. So the question is what exactly does it look like to worship away from the stage? And here, keep in mind, I'm using that definition of worship that says to honor, to show reverence for God, to regard with greater extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. So I'm specifically dealing with the worship aspect here. So here are some ideas, four things that we can chew on. That, we can, that, that show us what worship away from the stage looks like. Number one, partake of food and drink in freedom. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 27 through 33. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. So yeah, partaking of food and drink in the freedom that Christ gives us is an act of worship away from the stage. Well, number two, be thankful. Just that simple. Be thankful. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. Yeah? And you can do this all the time away from the stage. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs sung from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 also shows us a little bit there. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Spiritually, we have a lot to be thankful for. You know, as far as our life is concerned, even if we don't feel very grateful, we can find something to be thankful for. We can find things for which to thank God. It is an act of worship away from the stage to be thankful. Number three, grow in wisdom 
and understanding. Yep, growing in wisdom and understanding. That's an act of worship. Going through and reading your Bible, learning more about God, growing in, growing in wisdom and understanding of who he is. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Grow in wisdom and understanding. Now, as you're reading your Bible, thank God and ask him to bring you further, read, further wisdom, further understanding. This is another act of worship away from the stage. Number four, be a living sacrifice. Okay, this is, a, this is kind of a tough one because you know, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? It's like, what, how does this even work? The concept, even to this day, the concept of being a living sacrifice, I think I kind of understand what's up with that, but it's still one of those things where in order for me to really walk out being a living sacrifice, I have to go through and check what the word is saying about this. You know? And so what do we have? In Romans 12, 1, Paul said, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So Paul's even saying here, like, this is, the tr this is true worship, is offering our bodies to God. To offer our bodies as living sacrifice. So again, so this is this is a very physical thing, apparently. You know? And what does that even look like? Well, it comes out in behaviors, it comes out in thoughts, it comes out in the way that you're working, the way that you're working your way through each day. So we can be a living sacrifice by not loving the worldly, but the godly. 1 John 2, 15 through 16. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. So don't love the worldly, but love the godly. What else can we do to be a living sacrifice? We can renew our mind in God's word. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be a living sacrifice. Don't love the worldly. Renew your mind in, Christ, in the word of God. It's not, as, it's not as difficult as one would think. It's not as confusing as one would think to be that living sacrifice. So, I've been known to ask this question of people, both at work and sometimes within church. I've asked the question, what's your, side of the, what's your side of the stage? And when I've asked that question, I've been known to limit it to the obvious three, on stage, backstage, facing the stage. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. When it comes to church services, it's good to learn the side of the stage God wants each of us on. It's where each of us will find the greatest fulfillment and closest, closeness to God in our worship experience. I recognize, though, that no matter 
which side of the stage we're on during the worship service. We're away from the stage much more than we're on any of the other three sides. I would argue then that while we learn what side of the stage God wants us on during service, we remember that no matter what. Our true side of the stage, our true side of the stage is away from the stage. Let us then be those worshipers away from the stage who worship him in spirit and in truth every day, every moment of, his, of our lives. For he is worthy. Father, I thank you. I thank you for who you are. And I thank you for the wonderful, wonderful things that you do in our lives. Whether we see them or not, whether we notice them or not, we praise your glorious and holy name, O God. We thank you. We love you. It is in the name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. If I could have the uh, ministry team come on down. If anybody needs prayer, just come on down for prayer. And I'd like to say thank you each and every one of you. And let's have a great Sunday, shall we? Amen. <laughs>